Welcome to AFI Fest 2020, presented by Audi. I'm Claudia Puig, Senior Programmer for AFI Fest. First, I want to thank all the supporters of the festival, our presenting sponsor, Audi, our AFI members, and you, our audience. We're here today with the director of the compelling film, New Order, director Michelle Franco. I have to say, wow, uh, thank you for your unflinching and provocative film about race and class and the grossly unequal distribution of wealth in Mexico and what comes of that conflagration. It's a brilliant film and it's so bold and tense and grim and I was riveted throughout. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm excited that uh, AFI is, is screening the movie. Unfortunately, you know, I'm, we're not together, but uh, nearly all my movies have been at the AFI. So I'm glad this is not an exception. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, we're thrilled that, that it's here and that you're with us today. Um, I understand you wrote the script four years ago, and yet it feels so timely and relevant now in 2020 in the wake in our country here of Black Lives Matter protests and, uh, you know, society is being pushed to the extreme, and it seems like this dystopia is closer day by day. Um, but it, Yeah, it, it, I, I started thinking about it six years ago and writing four years ago. I had the script uh, three years ago and it was financed and I finished shooting a year and a half ago, but it was interesting and strange that throughout that process, uh, the yellow vests in, 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 uh, in France and in Chile and Colombia and in Hong Kong and uh, the Arab uh, Spring and everywhere uh, up until Black Lives Matter uh, a few months ago, uh, the, you know, I was proved time and again that the film needed to be made and, and, and uh, that my approach into not making a political movie, but into just keeping, uh, 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 exploring as much as I could the social uh, aspects of uh, my characters, the way they relate and uh, the, the movie would work better for audiences worldwide because for me it's very important that it's not only a Mexican movie. So it, it's strange how close it feels to reality now and, and I'm sad about it of course because when you write a, a dystopic piece, a dystopian piece, you, you're, not, you, you're actually hoping not to arrive to that point. Absolutely, but you're right, it's such a specific film about Mexico and about Latin America, and yet it is so relatable throughout the world. Um, I, and that is, you know, um, it feels like the inequity between the haves and have nots is, is growing everywhere. Um, yeah. And um, I love that you, you captured Mexico so specifically, and yet it resonates for everyone. And that sounds like that was your goal to, to make it as universal as possible. Um, yeah, that was, that was I, I, when I'm writing a movie, I think about Mexican audiences and worldwide audiences and, and not about festivals. I, I, festivals are fantastic because they are uh, a way of getting the film to, you know, to the, it, it's best known through festivals. And I love actual screenings, which is not happening now. I don't like the only streaming thing. I like cinema theaters, but uh, I also decided this was, uh, I, I was first holding the movie for next year, but then, watching Black Lives Matter on, on, on TV and everything developing, I said, you know, the, I, I should release a movie as soon as there's a great opportunity. And of course, Venice is a fantastic film festival. They were brave to, to, to make, a, 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 you know, a, a real uh, audience screenings and all, uh, because the pandemic was terrible there before it hit Mexico and North America. So they were able to, and I think that was a great opportunity. And then we got the prize, which uh, of course helps the movie. Now we're trying to understand what's the way to, 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 to uh, you know, the purpose of the movie, it's a cautionary tale. We w I'd like everyone to see this movie and, and how not to arrive to that, spo that point. So we need uh, audiences, of course, for that. Absolutely. And we should say you're, you're in San Sebastian right now, where another audience will soon be watching it. Correct. Yeah, we, we had a screening a couple of days ago and, oh. and it was a, a, a really good screening. Uh, I, so 
yeah, I got to get out of Mexico, which was complicated because yeah. pandemic super, you know, I, I think it's worse than in the States. But I was able to get out and, 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 and promote the movie. And, and I'm glad about this opportunity. Absolutely. And you're so right about it being a cautionary tale. It just, um, it has so much tension. There's such a sense of mounting dread. It's so perfectly paced that way. And yet it's never melodramatic. Um, the way it begin, draws us in, begins draws us in so well in the hospital. And then, you know, going to the, the wedding where everything seems like a false sense of sort of comfort. And it's so tenuous. Um, I, I love that it feels like real humans behaving the way real humans do. How challenging is that to sort of get that pacing and everything? Uh, it, it, it's always a challenge while writing a movie, but uh, no other, my movie has eight main characters and it's at the same, it, 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 it's very important the way they talk and relate to each other. And at the same time, I'm trying to make a, a, a study of a whole country. So, and it has to be done through the characters. So how do you do that uh, and, and still have uh, real characters with depth and not just uh, archetypes or however you say it. So it, it, it was very hard uh, to both to write and to shoot. I think the actors did a great job. I, I had really good actors that with little time on screen made the most out of it. and and. I think also the the fact that the, something's always happening on screen, there, there, uh, something's always developing on screen, helps a lot uh, because things are told to, through actions, not through dialogue. So they just, you know, the camera is following them, and there's a lot going on. Absolutely, this is your sixth film, correct? Um, yes. And your other films, this feels like it's the most ambitious and sprawling you had. Did I understand 3,000 extras in this film? We had 3,000 extras. We had to close down all the main avenues uh, of Mexico City. Uh, Reforma. Again, it's, uh, Reforma, Cabeza de Juarez, which is where the choppers are flying by. Uh, Coyoacán, which is a very emblematic place with the cathedral. Uh, Mazarik, the most important commercial street where Louis Vuitton uh, was shot. Uh, so it was a challenge time and again, every day was a challenge. Uh, and then, of course, the VFX that need, you know, they, 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 it's important that they look invisible, not like VFX. That was hard to, to, to achieve. Well, they did look invisible because I, I, when I was reading about VFX, I thought, wow, I didn't even think about that because it was so, it felt like such a human personal thing. It didn't, I didn't think about effects at all. So uh, you did it in such a, a nimble way. Um, and I love how you laid out the film, the, again, the pacing, the twists, the turns, the, you know, events happen, uh, come out of other events and it just feels so organic. Your film really captures that. Um, in the scripting of it, did you, did it go through different uh, iterations or did you always kind of envision it the, the way we saw it on screen? Uh, I, while writing the script, I wasn't, I was worried production was wise, how to achieve everything that, that had to be done because along with my two producers, Christina and Erendira, I'm a producer. So whenever I'm writing, I, I'm, I'm already thinking, is this feasible or not? So I don't just write whatever comes to my mind. Uh, but having said that, I do leave a lot of room to uh, the camera work and the, and the framing and the maison son is it's all uh, decided with the cinematographer. I do rely heavily on, on my cinematographer. Uh, so, and, and of course the locations, uh, the, the main house where the first third of the movie or, or a bit more takes place, it's a key location and, and we had to adapt to the space. Uh, and then there's my long shots, you know, like two, three minute shots where, where uh, I, 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 I like long shots because they, they, they feel real and, and they give the, the actors the opportunity to truly develop their feelings on screen and go from point A, B, C, et cetera, without it being, you know, the usual cinematic tricks. But in this case, it was a mix of everything. I, so I didn't have a preconceived idea about how to shoot it. I just, you know, kept, uh, figuring out what was the best for each scene. Did you go through a rehearsal process with the actors? 
No, I avoid rehearsal. I, I, we just rehearsed a lot, for example, the long shot, the scene where, uh, where the intruders jump into the wedding and, and everything that happened, because that's a scene at the beginning, they're holding, uh, they're holding a regular party. They're, they're still at that, you know, party uh, mode. And then uh, the intruders jump and then they discover the guy with a gun. And then they 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 assume that the help the bodyguard or to, you know the 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 gunman of the house will protect them and and it keeps changing so I, that scene we had to rehearse a lot like like during weekends we we would go but not so much for the performance it was more for camera to understand if we could pull it in a single shot and also to see if it worked and. We kept adding, first we rehearsed only with the main actors and then we kept adding a little bit of extras and uh, so because th we also had a limited amount of bullets. Uh, everything was limited. I didn't have a, a you know, the, the possibility of doing everything 10 times or, or more. So I, we had to be accurate. Wow, that's amazing. I think I heard you say in an interview that um, when you were a child, you asked your father why there were so many poor people and, um, you know, why are we privileged? And I wondered, you know, Mexico has such social disparity. They're, they're you know, the power and the money are in the hands of so few and white people. And then there's so many brown skinned people who are struggling. Is this something that you've thought about a lot? Uh, I'm assuming you grew up in Mexico. All the time, yeah, yeah. I, I when when people ask me what was the research for this movie, I've been, you know, my forty-one years I've spent them in Mexico City. My father was born in Juarez up north, uh, so he was also, and and he's from a very poor background. He's uh, the eldest of seven siblings, uh, had to quit school when he was twelve to to work and help out. So he has, I think, he passed on 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 us on on his kids also a sense, you know. We understand what he went through, and uh, he also lived. Uh, he would constantly be over the border to El Paso. So uh, we lived a privileged life, but I think he let us always know what being poor meant when he was growing up, and and how little opportunities opportunities people have. Uh, it's almost like the system in Mexico is is built in a way where you cannot. Uh, you you cannot succeed. Uh, I think my father was was uh, was extremely lucky, and uh, and it was an easier era to. Uh, there there wasn't 24 million people in Mexico City. Now everything's more compact and complicated. Everything's tighter. Uh, so yes, I. The, what's sad is that when you grow up, you keep listening. You know things are like this, and they won't change. I guess it's the same with Black Lives Matter. For centuries in the states, Afro American uh, Afro Americans lived and died without hope of an equal. And come on, I mean, there's Martin Luther King and all that uh, in in the sixties, and 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 nothing really changed. We can see, you know, we're twenty in, in twenty twenty, and the states would like to show the world how civilized everything is, and it, it's not. It's absolutely not because. The police are killing people like George Floyd. Uh, pull, uh, police brutality and militarization, and 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 the states are supposed to be, you know, the the most democratic country and so on. So what's left for a country like Mexico that that is way behind the states, way behind? So it's again not a political. Uh, my 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 stand, my point of view is not a political one, but a social one and a. From a humanistic point of view, we really need to change things and we really need to feel some empathy for the others. The good thing about Black Lives Matter is that, that at least from what I saw on, on, from Mexico City, it united people. people it, it wasn't a black protest. It was really like everyone outside saying we're tired. And then, of course, it was scary to hear the eat, eat the rich uh, chants on Beverly Hills. And you'd wonder, you know, again, it felt so close to my movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't get to the extreme that I portray, but uh, we're getting there and it's the same everywhere. People are very tired and if we don't change the way we're living, uh, there's, we're going to arrive to an to a, to a awful, awful extreme. Absolutely. 
No. Um, I mean, I was wondering how likely you think something like this could happen. I think about Mexico. I think about the, my grandfather was was a revolutionary back in the, the revolution, um, you know, and then became a part of the government. And you know, then there's corruption. So the revolution, I don't know what it meant really ultimately. And I wonder, you know, could that happen? And since it's happened before in Mexico, it's happened here, but it, you know, is the very beginning of our country. How likely do you think something like that could happen? I hope not, but I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it does. Uh, and I know that in Mexico, most of the, uh, uh, the, the there's, they're canceling support for culture and education and cinema and everything is going to militarization. So it's almost like saying they're getting ready for that. They know it's coming, but uh, I don't think it could happen the way it does in my movie in terms of the big explosion. I think it would be contained before it arrives to that point, but the outcome, the second part of my movie, I don't see it far from reality at all. Yeah. At the same time, there's also a lot of ambiguity in your movie um, because we don't really know, you know, when the, when the uprisings happen and when the takeover happens, we don't know exactly what happens. I feel like there's always so much mystery surrounding politics in Latin America, so much is kept secret. Um, you know, the people are puppets of larger, more corrupt forces, and your, your film really captures that. Um, yeah, because we, we never know, we're just pawns, uh, you know, you, you, we're, we're just being played by, by, by bigger uh, uh, and, and dark forces, and we never know what's going on. Actually, we never know, you know, <laughs> it's almost like a, 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 what, what, who killed JFK? I mean, we know who, who killed him, but why, you know? And I don't want to get into conspiracy theaters, but, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later, we know nothing about what happened worldwide and definitely not in Mexico. We still don't know what happened to talk about more recent events, the 43 students uh, in Mexico that, in Ayotzinapa with this. But that's just one example of many, many, many. And, and people are killed by the hour in Mexico. And, and we never know, uh, there's no official truth ever. We never know what's, what's going on. So that ambiguity and, and that, uh, the fact that everybody will end up losing the way I portray in the movie, I think it's also uh, close to, to the way we're already living. So it's a dystopian movie, but um, there's nothing new in it. It's, it's, uh, it's just organized in a different way and it's set in the near future. Uh, but if you see uh, dictatorships in Chile, in, in uh, Peru, in, in so many countries, uh, just talking about Latin America and South America, it, it's, we're just going back backwards, I think. And of course, Europe during the 30s and 40s, uh, come on. Yeah, and there's a lot of fascism going on in Europe right now, too. The yeah. Scary things. Yeah. I was struck by um, how privileged and entitled white men still seem to fare well while the women and children seem to suffer the most um, in your film? Uh, maybe just because they're more vulnerable. Um, but I don't know if they're suffering more. I, I, I guess most of my movies have uh, female leads and I'm used to writing for, I find it more interesting to explore stories through through when i work with tim roth it's a bit of an exception but even that i had written for a woman and he asked me to change it for him but mm -hmm. lucia was a girl she's actually the sister of the main actress in this movie mm -hmm. um so maybe what you're saying uh, is because of marianne's point of view i don't know i just find it more interesting to write female characters yeah well speaking of marianne i, I found her such an interest intriguing character because She's a central character. She's likable. She's trying to do the right thing, but she has a very limited understanding of what's really going on because she's still in her bubble of privilege. Um, she has the will, but to to help seemingly, but it's not enough. Um, yeah, and 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 like you said, she's 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 quite naive. She doesn't have a full understanding, of, and we do need to understand as much as we can. It's, it's not just like I want to help, and you know. Uh, so, but who has a deeper understanding? I, I don't, I try not to judge my characters altogether. And at least Marianne is, is, 
she empathizes and she's trying to do something at least the brother is uh you know the brother is is um just trying to shake the rolando's character who's asking for help uh, but again would it be much different in, in reality how many families would actually help rolando more than the characters of this family did i'm, I'm sadly i think most people wouldn't do more than not even that probably yeah and it's easy there's a lot of, to sit there and judge sitting in yeah. the movie sorry yeah because when you're watching a movie you expect the characters to to have strong morals and to become to behave like like fictional you know like to be role models or something and especially hollywood movies keep teaching us you know the the, the characters should learn and teach us something and so on but life's not like that and I try to build a movie that goes beyond the cinema, the, the formulaic cinematic experience, but to still make it uh, entertaining and with a good pace, you know, with a strong pace. Uh, because I don't, I don't like, I don't like when films are boring. That to me, that's uh, uh, I, I always fear boring the audience because when I go watch a movie, I want to be. Uh, I want to be teased and I, I want to be surprised and you know I, it, it should be f fun in a way I don't know if that's the right label the way to label this movie but it should be uh, dynamic it's definitely dynamic and propulsive there is not a moment not a second that I was bored I, I can't imagine anyone being bored in this film um, I, it's, uh, that makes me think about the pacing are you very involved in the editing process because editing is really what can create that propulsive feeling yeah 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 I, I i i was sitting with the editor this was a year of editing it's my longest process so far uh, and it was hard to to find how to jump from one character to the other and from one location to the next and from a story without it feeling uh, like you're interrupting the narrative it was hard it was my editor is great he's uh much more experienced than i he's 60 something uh, 62 or something like that so he's edited like a hundred movies and i rely heavily on him that's amazing well the the year of spent editing really shows because it, it the, the pacing is amazing what kind of um reactions have you gotten in venice and, and san sebastian so far from people or, or anybody who's seen the film well venice was great uh, not only because of the award but the everybody was talking about the movie and like a must see i what i like the more uh, the most about uh and 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 now that in san sebastian i'm even in a jury what i'm looking for in movies and what i want to achieve is people should find something new i'm not saying i invented something totally different but uh people were saying well, we haven't seen a movie like this in a long time or they wouldn't know what to compare it with and and to me that's that's uh the best thing I can hear that it's that it's a thing on its own. Absolutely, yeah. So, and I like the, you know, it's not like it's a message movie, but it is telling us that unless we improve society, yeah. nobody wins. It's definitely not a message movie because if it would have meant, been meant to to be a you know to pass messages, it, it would be a lot more simple. So yeah, I, I agree with you. It's a way of saying let's not arrive there, but but it's it's not a simple. That's a simple. That's a big idea. But then there's a lot of uh, of complicated situations that I tried to develop, and and that was the hardest thing writing the script. Speaking of that, I was going to ask you what was the most challenging in terms of shooting it. A few, I guess. Whenever I had to to not only control, uh, you know, not only had to have like uh, thousands or uh, hundreds uh, of extras but to make to make it feel real uh, all the violence to portray violence in a realistic way not a glamorous way it shouldn't be fun to watch all this violence uh, all the military all the soldiers are real soldiers that was uh, uh, the the and the, they come from Amat Escalante movie Eli he 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 introduced me to these people and, and they were great. They made everything a lot more easy. They were real soldiers then? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And they just occasionally will, when called upon to make movies, will... No, they're ex, ex extras, soldiers, okay. for, former soldiers. Oh, soldiers. I see, okay. They now work, they don't work on cinema. This is the second time they're uh, 
engaged on a movie. No, they are uh, into private security now. Well, this has been fascinating. I, I just, this, as, I, as you know, this movie spoke to me very much and I'm so happy that it won the award in Venice and I'm so grateful that you've been here with us um, and I'm very eager to hear the reactions of the people who see it here. So I want to thank everyone who listened in here today. Please tell your friends so that this film is available to screen until the end of the festival. We'd love to hear from you on social media, hashtag AFI Fest, and please join us for more great films and virtual events at fest.afi.com. And thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you.